Today we're going to talk about technical writing as well as some considerations for plain language use and how the writing process can help support technical communication. So to begin with, what is technical writing? My favorite definition is that technical writing is all writing that is for and about business and industry. So if you think of all the writing that's done for business and industry as part of services, um, product use, etc., and anything that's written about business and industry, uh, that's a pretty wide range of types of writing that would be covered. Um, it's also known as business writing, workplace writing, professional writing, and occupational writing. And in fact, some people find it easier to think about what isn't technical writing, um, since it's more often easier to see, for example, academic writing, things that are done uh, for school purposes, or creative writing, um, things that are written for primarily entertainment and personal uh, use. So when you wake up in the morning until you go to bed at night, you're going to see technical writing everywhere. So for example, directions on a tube of toothpaste, nutritional benefits on a box of cereal, business letters and catalogs if you still receive snail mail or the internet equivalent, written instructions for assembling a product or using a service, product use safety disclaimer information, so warning, special notices that try to protect the company and its interests, as well as customers. And there are some requirements for technical writing. So they are usually presented in a business-specific format, so often email, memos, reports. They're pieces of writing that are clear, concise, and accurate. They take into account primarily the audience's needs and consider their biases and prior understanding. So this is, again, important when you're thinking about the audience that your writing is reader-centered and not writer-centered. It helps pre present information uh, for readers to solve problems, gain a better understanding of a situation, or do something. So unlike academic writing, which is often showing off, look what I've done or look what I've learned, uh, technical writing is actually trying to get the reader to know or do something. And technical writing typically conveys technical, complex, or specialized information uh, in a way that is easy for audiences to understand. So knowing more about your audience is going to be very important with technical writing. There are some common characteristics. These are just rules of thumbs and averages, not absolute requirements. But if you look at a bunch of pieces of technical writing, there are things that you'll notice will be pretty consistent. So for example, the average sentence length is going to be much shorter than what you would find in academic or creative writing. So the average sentence length is going to be 15 words compared to academic writing, which has an average sentence length of 25 words, so almost twice the length. Uh, the average paragraph length is going to be two to four sentences, or 150 words. However, you can often have one sentence paragraphs if needed. Uh, so just in general, the paragraphs are going to be much shorter than academic writing, and there's no rule on length or number of sentences for paragraphs. The formatting is almost always single-spaced. Uh, very, very rarely would you ever see uh, something at 1.5 or double spacing for technical writing because it's all about presenting something that is accessible to the reader and looks short and easy to read, as well as printing costs and concerns. So if you can print something on one page instead of two, obviously you would go with one page. The tone and voice is always going to be professional. So normally uh, humor is not part of technical writing because humor is you know, dependent on the culture, whether or not it's even going to be understood. And then generally humor is not considered uh, very professional. So it's something to keep in mind that usually humor is um, very rare or absent from technical writing. It's going to be 100% accurate information, 
and that includes being grammatically correct so that you don't accidentally cause uh, miscommunication or potentially even injury to your readers. Visuals and graphics are going to be very common. Uh, you know that saying, a picture is worth a thousand words. Uh, well, it really is. <laughs> so pictures, diagrams, graphs, etc. Very common because you can get a lot of information displayed very quickly and you just want to be careful with what readers take away from those visuals and using them appropriately. And then you can definitely use color and other forms of emphasis such as bold uh, but you want to be careful not to emphasize everything. You want to be sparingly uh, using color and other forms of emphasis so that readers can really tell what should be emphasized versus what's less important. For a little example of how technical writing and academic writing compare, the purpose is very different. So technical writing, you're recording information, informing people or persuading people. Um, but academic writing may have some overlap, for example, informing or persuading people. But ultimately, it's to earn a grade, so demonstrating the capacity to perform that skill or demonstrating that that knowledge has been learned. The audience for technical writing is typically high-tech, low-tech, lay audience, and multiple audience. So high-tech, you would pretty much be talking with peers, either within the field or within a project or a company, uh, so they would understand your lingo, your terminology, the context of what's going on. Low-tech means that they have some familiarity with the context and the terminology, but you might need some explanation and some de definitions here and there. A lay audience is just like a general audience, so anybody walking up, what would they know? And they would definitely need more context and definitely uh, definitions, explanation of things. And the most difficult one to handle is the multiple audience, because you could have a document that needs to address high-tech and low-tech audiences or high-tech, low-tech, and lay audiences. Uh, and when you're trying to scaffold multiple audiences, that's when it gets really difficult because each audience needs something different. And you don't want to bore the high-tech audience with information that's needed by the low-tech or lay audiences. For example, uh, definitions, explanation, background, context. So you need to provide the information in such a way that it's scannable, and we'll talk about that shortly, that there are ways to do that so that high-tech readers can skip things that low-tech and lay audiences would need. Um, but the audience for academic writing is usually pretty simple in that it's the instructor, ultimately, who's giving you the grade. Uh, and sometimes instructors frame it as, oh, other students or other college-educated audiences. The message, uh, you're going to be providing knowledge or instructions through technical writing versus <laughs> academic writing is, again, showing what you've learned or that you have the skills and capabilities. And probably the most noticeable just looking at the two documents would be the format. Technical writing is going to be single spaced, made as short as possible, as concise as possible. Um, typically the paragraphs are fully left uh, justified, not using tabs, but having extra line spaces in between paragraphs. Uh, whereas academic writing is going to be double spaced at 2.0 they are going to have indented paragraphs so the first line of each paragraph uh, starts with a tab no extra line spaces between paragraphs etc um, so just glancing at these documents you'd be able to say yep that's tech writing yep that's academic writing because they will look so different this is just a list of uh, types of technical writing out there it's not comprehensive uh, but just some examples, advertisements, brochures, creating a budget, uh, creating contracts, descriptions, email, incident reports, um, a poster, 
uh, interview questions, a job application, uh, either from the business side where they're describing the job and creating a posting, or from the applicant side, creating resumes, cover letters, etc. Um, letters of recommendation, marketing plans, meeting minutes, newsletters, uh, let's see, questionnaires, any kind of research report that's for or about business and industry. Um, in a class, you'll even see examples of technical writing in that a syllabus is a contract uh, between the instructor and students, so it's a type of technical writing. Uh, any kind of training manuals or instruction guides, web pages for and about business and industry. So lots of technical writing out there. Another part of technical writing uh, that has a relatively new name is called plain language. So previously we used to talk about just being concise and being reader focused, reader centered. Um, but there's actually new terminology in this idea of using plain language, which has been adopted by technical writers and governments. So plain language, uh, it's the idea that everything that you create and publish or share, um, your audience should be able to find what they need, understand what they find, and use that information to meet their needs which sounds pretty easy, but you would be surprised <laughs> how oftentimes uh, writers think about instead what they want and what they need versus what their readers need. Um, they're focused on um, what they have to get done versus what the readers ultimately have to know or accomplish. And at the center of this would be uh, reader preferences. And three main categories here is that readers prefer writing that is scannable, concise, and jargon-free. So scannable, meaning they can jump in and out of the text whenever they want and find what they're looking for quickly. So academic writing, if you're writing a paper, you can more or less assume that your instructor, probably, is going to read the whole thing. And so you are assuming they're going to stick with you and you can just go point by point whatever you want to cover. But that's not true with technical writing. When you're providing information or trying to get the reader to do something um, and they have no obligation to you, <laughs> then you need to make it scannable because they're going to jump in and out, skip things, and that's okay. That's what readers do. Uh, so you just can't assume that they're going to read the whole thing and then say, but I put it in there. All right, so um, in making things scannable, you'll want to use bullet points or numbered lists. That makes information quicker and easier to see and understand. So bullet point lists and numbered lists are very common with technical writing. It's also very common to use headings and section divisions to break up the text into manageable chunks. And using appropriate headings will help your reader know, do I even need to read this section or am I good and I can just move on to the next one. Uh, looking at tables and figures helps readers quickly get information, things to take away without having a ton of words to read through and internalize. So graphs, tables, pictures, diagrams, really common. And typically this information is not duplicating something that's written in text, it's replacing something that you would write with words. So you don't want the information in there twice, you're just finding a more effective way to demonstrate that. And then appropriate use of emphasis and abbreviations uh, shows them where to go, what's, what you consider important for them, and then abbreviations when appropriate so that you're condensing things down, making it look more accessible. Things need to be concise and easy to understand. So a goal is always to have things as short as possible. And typically writers will overwrite. They'll provide more information than their readers need. And they're like, oh, it's better to write too much than not enough. 
But what research has actually found is that it's the opposite, that if you provide too much information and something looks long and involved, readers actually will skip it rather than reading through the information. So you need to find this balance between being concise and short, but not being too short to the point where you're uh, removing or forgetting important information. And it's really tricky and it takes time uh, to develop that skill. And then easy to understand, you know, nothing is worse than looking at a sentence and having to read it four or five times and saying, what is this person trying to say? Um, and in business settings, you can't assume that somebody is going to read something once, let alone multiple times. So people need to understand what you're saying the first time they're reading a sentence or the first time they're looking at a visual. And then jargon-free or audience-appropriate language uh, is referring to the concept that you're writing to the appropriate audience. So high-tech peer-level writing, you can go ahead and use field-specific terminology, project-specific terminology, etc., uh, and not worry about your reader not understanding what that is. Um, but if you're writing to a low-tech audience or a lay audience, you do need to provide alternatives so that uh, people know what you're talking about uh, without necessarily having to explain all the big concepts in the field, all the big pieces of uh, terminology in the field. So to give you an example of scannable here, uh, this is what and a drug label used to look like um, just a couple decades ago. And there are some good parts here in that the title is really big, so you know immediately what the title is there. Uh, there are some section headings, so for example, indications, directions, each tablet contains warnings. Um, those are bold and all caps, drawing your attention to them. But there is also a lot of wording squished together, which is pretty hard to read. So if you look at modern drug labels, these are not perfect <laughs> because, you know, lawyers have to have a hand in uh, protecting the companies. But it is better in that there are divisions, so you can see there are actual line breaks dividing up chunks of inf information. So you have um, headings and then the information, and then a line break. Heading, information, line break. You can see there are bullet points, whether they are horizontal here or vertical bullet points. And you can see a table down here where they have a table showing if this, take this many. So if you're this many years old, take this many, etc. So it's better, <laughs> improved upon, than the original. Here's another example. This is from the Deed, Minnesota Deed website. Um, and they have a lot of information for job seekers and companies that are seeking employees. And so they do a very good job of having a ton of information that's sortable and accessible. So, for example, on the left hand side, they have a um, menu that has descriptive headings, section headings, which is useful. They also always have the title as the biggest text on the page. They also use emphasis appropriately, so only one chunk of text is bold here, which appears to be their tagline. Uh, they have a description in big text. Here's what's going on here. So see how Minnesota stacks up against any combination of states. And then these would be the links you would click on if you specifically wanted to jump into business climate or demographics or economy. And if you didn't know what those were or what those would cover, they have a little description below, overall per capita GDP by state, etc. An example of being concise would be jury instructions. So California... Um, several years ago had a set of jury instructions for what would be a lay audience or general audience that's pretty confusing, I think, anyway. Um, so if you look at the before here, 
Failure of recollection is common. Innocent misrecollection is not uncommon. And you're talking about everyday people who don't want to be there probably in the first place, and you're asking them to unpack this language, which is not very good. So instead, a way to revise that to make it more concise and easily understood on the first reading is to say, people often forget things or make mistakes in what they remember, which is a very good revision, putting it into plain language for jurors. Another consideration would be how you're phrasing things. So there is mood and tone attached to writing, and the way you say something can be interpreted as a negative or as positive or neutral. So a negative way of saying something would be, we cannot process your claim because the necessary forms have not been completed. So you're saying what you can't do and assigning blame. <laughs> you haven't done this, right? Uh, and that might be true, but there is a positive or neutral way that you can spin it. Instead, you can say, your claim will be processed as soon as you complete the necessary forms. So instead of saying what you can't do, you're putting the onus on the reader and you're saying this will be done as soon as you do this. Another example, we do not take phone calls after 3 p.m. on Fridays, looking at what you won't do versus phrasing it, you may reach us by telephone on Fridays until 3 p.m. And then final example, we closed your case because we never received the information requested in our letter sent on April 2nd. Phrase it better. Your case will be reactivated, so what will happen, as soon as you provide the information requested in our letter sent on April 2nd. So you need to do something as the reader, provide us that information. And then, because nobody keeps track of letters or it's a possibility it wasn't even sent, please let us know if you need a copy of the letter. So give them an option on how to get that information if they lost it or misplaced it or never received it in the first place. And then we have a couple examples here of removing jargon, inappropriate acronyms, and unnecessary capitalization. So first example, CPR instruction will be held in the foster care program meeting room on the fourth floor of the MHB. So the problem here is you have a lot of capitalization, foster care program meeting room, which I'm guessing is actually not an official name of the room in the first place. And even if it were, most people don't know it by that name. So it's actually better to lowercase in this case um, because capital letters make it more difficult for readers to read wording sentences uh, and it's easier to pick up when things are lowercase. And then MHB, I don't know what that means, right? So if I'm not familiar with a building, in this case, fourth floor of a building, which building, MHB, that doesn't help me, um, I would want to know which building. However, CPR, cardiopulmonary resuscitation, that is actually more commonly used as an acronym than as a uh, fully written out term. So you would want to leave CPR. Next example, see the supervisor at the west entrance for more information on the Q1 official report. So we'd want a lowercase supervisor because that is not someone's specific title. It's just a supervisor, the supervisor. We're lowercasing west entrance because unless that's a business name, it wouldn't be capitalized. And Q1, I would say a good number of people know that that means quarter one, but not everybody. So I would recommend writing out first quarter or quarter one, and then lowercasing official report, because that is not the name of it. It's just, you know, explaining what it is, the official report. Removing needless words. Dunn Brothers provided complimentary coffee at no charge. 
corrected to Dumb Brothers provided free coffee. You could actually <clears throat> get rid of complimentary or at no charge, depending on your audience. Um, complimentary can be used for sure. Um, it's just that some audiences might not know what complimentary means. So if they're English as a second language user or um, you know, not from this culture or this region, they may be like, complimentary, what does that mean? Or younger, <laughs> younger uh, readers, listeners don't always really know what that means. So a way to make it shorter and more clear would be to use free instead. Another example of removing needless words, despite the fact that the writing training was required and very important, she skipped it. My personal opinion is that she should be fired. And we can shorten that to less than half the length by saying, because she skipped the required training, she should be fired. So we're reducing some of the description, like very important. And then you don't have to say, my personal opinion is. If you're making a statement, it's assumed that it's your perspective, your opinion. An issue that pops up somewhat frequently in technical writing, particularly because of the use of bullet point lists, would be to make sure that phrases have, uh, are adhering to parallelism. So that means that you're saying each item the same way using the same grammatical structure. So for example here, to apply, complete the application, show valid identification, fee is $75. Well, that's a problem because the first two are verbs, complete and show. And then the third word is a noun. The fee is this. Um, so you want to turn that into verb, verb, verb. So how you would fix that to apply, complete the application, show valid identification, pay $75 by cash or check. Another example that's not using a bullet point list she presented the information clearly, accurately, and in a thorough manner. She presented the information clearly, accurately, and thoroughly. So you can see we have L-Y, L-Y, and so you want to end with L-Y. And last issue that pops up somewhat frequently is the use of active voice over passive voice. So active voice, the subject of the sentence is doing the action or the main verb of the sentence. Um, here you have passive voice. For help text, the F2 key must be pressed. It's still conveying information, but it's a little awkward, clunky, and confusing. Instead, you would want to tell the reader, press the F2 key for help. And another example. Copies of the attached forms must be included to ensure accurate submission. Instead, say attach copies of the form to ensure accurate submission. And the last section here talking about the writing process. So the writing process is typically categorized into three stages, pre-writing, drafting, and rewriting. And pre-writing is all of the brainstorming and planning of the information that you're going to include. Drafting is when you sit down and start writing the first draft. And rewriting is everything that helps you improve upon the draft that you've written. So some pre-writing considerations for technical writing in particular, but also any type of writing. Uh, is who is your audience? So how many people? Who are they? Think about their educational, attainment, background, geographical location. Sometimes it matters what language they speak or how comfortable they are with various languages. Um, what do they know or what do they do? Why do they need this information? So that's bringing in the purpose. What do they need to do after getting this information? So if you actually want them to do something, it's very important that you're clear and explain that. Uh, what are the factors that influence their response? 
And then are they up, down, across, or out? So audiences, if you're internal uh, within a company, you can go up, so communicating up to bosses, supervisors, etc. You communicate down to people working under you or at a different level below where you're working, or across, which would be uh, peers or people of equivalent status in the organization. And you would have a different tone and a different way of approaching each group. And external audiences is when you're talking uh, or writing out. So this group is outside of your organization and that has additional considerations because they'll need probably additional background and context as well as some additional relationship management. Another pre-writing consideration, what is your purpose? So at a very high level, your purpose should be to inform, persuade, or entertain. So you can inform them about information they need to know, persuade them to do something or believe something, or entertain them. And for technical writing, you should not be entertaining people because that is uh, going to grant against some of the other uh, main tenets of technical writing. You can be interesting, but you shouldn't be trying to entertain them in the way a magazine article or a book would entertain people. Uh, but some specific purposes within informing and persuading might be um, instructing someone how to put together a chair, how to or, uh, convincing a company to buy a product or service over alternatives, so making a recommendation making the case that something is needed or writing a disclaimer so that the company isn't liable for customer injury and that can be a legal matter something that can go to court and then finally you want to consider after audience and purpose what is your message so what do you need to tell or show the audience and remember, generally, we give too much information and we need to ease back, give them only what they need, not what you want to give them. Uh, and you frame that based on your audience and purpose. You also need to pick the best communication channel. In technical writing, you have a lot of options for how to get this information to people. And again, it depends on who your audience is, if they're internal or external, and what information you're getting, you're trying to get across. So email is very common. Um, it's, it used to be considered more informal, but now we use it for formal and informal communication, both with internal and external audiences. Memos are more formal because those are meant to be printed. So it's more of a legal printed record. A report is something that's longer, so usually a report has to be two plus pages in length. Uh, you can also consider just talking to someone in person, in a meeting, in the hallway, you know, or on the phone. Uh, sometimes if it's a touchy matter or something that needs to be done immediately, it's better to just communicate verbally. You could also share the information via PowerPoint whether that's in a meeting or just sending the PowerPoint to people. Uh, we have Skype and Instant Messenger these days. Uh, used to be just for personal use and then business took it over. So it's very common uh, if you need quick informal communication to Skype or Instant Message people. Text message depends on your relationship with the people you're communicating with. Um, also, you know, keep in mind it should be short, so don't write a book when you're texting somebody and make sure that it is somebody who would be okay with receiving a text message because it's considered a little more aggressive than an email. You're actually um, communicating with, you know, their phone number and it's considered sometimes personal because oftentimes people have personal phones that they use for business purposes. Um, but they're still paying for them, etc. And then letters, um, they're kind of going 
uh, to the wayside because they're expensive and not needed very much anymore. Uh, but if you have an external audience you're communicating to, like customers or another company, uh, you might consider sending a letter. It's more formal and it's actually also more memorable now that we have all these different forms of electronic communication. Um, it's more memorable and can have a bigger impression on people. At some point, you need to figure all of that out <laughs> and be done with your your pre-writing, which may also include research that you have to conduct and so on. Uh, but at some point you have to be done and actually start drafting as the second stage of writing. And you sit down and you just need to start drafting. And allow yourself to make mistakes because you don't want to try to make yourself to be perfect the first time because it's not going to happen. And it gives you unnecessary anxiety. So let yourself be messy and exploratory in a first draft as long as you plan to clean up that draft later which is when you get to rewriting and how much revision you need is dependent on who you're talking to who you're communicating with and what your message is so option number one if you're really close to somebody and it's just a quick informal email you might not do any rewriting at all you might just type 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 send and if you have a typo or a confusing sentence, who cares, it's somebody that you know. Um, the next level up would be just to proofread. So typing out an email quick, for example, but then you actually read what you've written to try to catch any typos or missing words. Uh, but just very quick looking at more at the word level. Option number three, doing some more, which is editing sentences and proofreading. So editing sentences is when you actually sit and consider sentences and you say, is this clear? Uh, is this as concise as possible? And then proofread for errors. And the last one, option number four, is when you go through the full re rewriting or revision process, which is where you revise. So you're looking at um, the overall content, audience appropriateness, purpose appropriateness, looking at paragraphs, are they coherent, well-developed, is everything organized at the paragraph and sentence level, etc. Uh, then you work on editing individual sentences for clarity and correctness of information being communicated, and then you proofread for errors. And you have to decide what you're going to do because each situation is different. If it's something quick and formal and you know the person well, you might opt to do none <laughs> or very little proofreading. Um, but if you are writing to a big group of people or it's a very important message or you're talking to really important people, you would probably want to do the full process just to make sure that you look good and the company you're representing looks good. And whenever possible, remember that you can bring another person or another couple people in to provide feedback. But I would probably limit it to about two to three people giving you feedback. Otherwise, you can have a paralyzing situation where everybody has very strong feelings about, you know, this word needs to be this, no, it needs to be this, um, and people disagreeing. And you can actually overwork the revision process uh, where you have too much input, uh, takes way too long to go through, figure out what everybody's going to write, you know, what each sentence is going to look like. Um, and then usually what happens is at the end, if you go back and look at the original versus the one after, you know, more than four people have looked at it, they're actually pretty similar and you've just wasted a lot of people's time. So usually limit it to one to two to three people um, so that you don't get overwhelmed with feedback and have issues with who is the real decision maker here on what the final product looks like. And for those of you who are skeptics, I myself was a bit of a skeptic in college. Um, I didn't always leave myself time to revise, edit, and proofread, uh, but it's really important to edit and proofread in particular uh, because we 
<laughs> often make mistakes and we're not even aware of them and we can't rely on our software to catch our mistakes. So Microsoft Word, Outlook email, etc. They're pretty good at catching some grammar and stylistic issues, but they're not going to catch all of them. And if you don't read something over carefully, you might miss mistakes. So for example, if you look at this paragraph, obviously it's full of issues. <laughs> every, almost every single word, except for the really little ones, has some kind of typo or misspelling. But you can still read it and probably read it pretty quickly. You know, it doesn't matter in what order the letters in a word are. The only important thing is that the first and last letter are in the right place, blah, 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 blah. Um, because when we're reading, we are actually looking for patterns, not individual letters. So when I'm reading a word, I do not sit there and say, important, I, M, P, and spell every letter until I get to the end and say, oh, it's important, the word is important. Um, instead, what our brains do is we look at the first letter and the last letter, and we look at a rough estimate of how many letters are in that word, and we say, oh, that word is the word important. So that's where a lot of typos and mistakes can come in uh, if you don't very carefully read through. And in technical writing, being precise and accurate with your information is more important than any other type of writing. Particularly if you're giving people instructions where they could potentially harm themselves. So for example, you're writing how to use a chainsaw um, you definitely don't want to give them inaccurate information because of typos or just careless communication because, you know, they could cut their leg off or something like that. And that's a very big deal. So if you look at some examples here, I want to ensure that this is an effective class that elicits a lot of participation. The information gets across. Some readers would probably be like, eh, something's wrong, but, you know, looks okay to me, but a lot of people would look at this and say, oh, um, there are some errors there, and I'm distracted by those errors. So to fix them, I want to ensure, ensure with an I is only used for insurance, like health insurance, dental insurance, ensure, you know, make sure uh, that this is an effective, not effective class, that elicits, not elicits with an I, meaning uh, illegal be behavior, um, but elicits. Um, I just say generally try to get rid of a lot of, um, I might use it when I'm speaking to people except for formal engagements, but I would never write it down because a lot and other words like very, they're just not necessary and they're pretty vague. And it's better to just say elicits participation. Another example to make less errors and take your writing farther, it's important that you learn simple techniques to solve everyday writing problems. And there's a few issues here. <laughs> to make fewer errors, less is if you don't know a specific amount of something. Uh, fewer is if it's something that's countable. So you can count errors, so you would want to say fewer. Um, if you were talking about uh, filling a glass with water, you would say less water, because I don't know how many water particles are in there. It's not countable. <laughs> um, and yes, that means that those lines at the grocery store that say 10 items or less is actually incorrect. It should be 10 items or fewer. Also, you're taking your writing further, not farther as in a distance. Um, it is, needs to be I-T apostrophe S when it's a contraction. Getting rid of the word very because it's not important. Adverbs, for the most part, don't help. And we have this interesting situation where every day and every day are actually switching meanings. So every day would mean every single day, writing problem. Um, every day as one word means ordinary. So an everyday problem, ordinary problem. Um, and we use these incorrectly so often <laughs> that they're actually becoming interchangeable because we find often 
that it's easier to go with the flow and make these small changes to language than to get everybody to use the right version of every day. <laughs> so just a reminder, for those of you who are working with English as a second language or English as your first language and this is, uh, you know, one of your uh, first courses or, you know, first, uh, first, you know, early exposures to considering the language, um, English is a difficult language. It's very difficult compared to some other languages. Um, so hooray. <laughs> but writing is also difficult because it's not instinctual. It is something that you have to learn and something that you have to practice. So the rules of English, the rules of writing, aren't really rules in the strict sense. They are agreed upon conventions. So you are part of a group of people that says, if you do this, this is how you should do it. Um, and those rules are changing. <laughs> uh, language is actually instinctual, but writing is a learned skill. So it's more difficult um, than when you're just trying to speak verbally to communicate. Um, so standard edited American English, if you ever see that phrase, that means if you're going to communicate with a group of people in the US, most of the time we're saying standard edited American English to communicate, but those are just agreed upon conventions, including spelling. <laughs> Uh, and we evolve over time. So new words appear, definitions and pronunciations change, spellings change. So you want to use language how it's currently being used. Uh, so for example, the two big dictionaries, the Oxford Dictionary and the Webster Dictionary, have both adopted the word awesome sauce and hangry. <laughs> Uh, these words were not words originally, but they have proliferated our society enough that they said, yep, it's now a word, you can use it. Uh, however, I would be careful that just because it's a word in the dictionary does not mean you should actually use it. Um, awesome sauce is fine when you're talking with friends or communicating for personal reasons, but you shouldn't use it in most business settings. The word literally is another example of a word changing meaning. Uh, so we use the word literally incorrectly enough that it also now means figuratively. <laughs> so it used to, me, used to be that literally meant actual and figuratively meant, you know, I'm exaggerating, this isn't real. Uh, but we use literally incorrectly enough that it can now mean literally, actually, or literally as in the figurative, uh, figurative sense. <clears throat> and then as far as pronunciations, um, those change frequently over time. Uh, the word daughter, for exam example, uh, until about 200 years ago, it was pronounced dafter, like laughter with an L. Um, but at some point in time, people started pronouncing it differently, probably when another language group met English speakers and adopted the different pronunciation. There are over 500,000 words in the Oxford Dictionary and counting, right? Um, you don't need to know them all. It's okay. You don't need to be responsible for knowing every single word in the English language. Uh, but you do need to be willing to look up words when you're not sure what something means. And when you are writing for people, it is best not to use the thesaurus because that is actually where people run into problems. They'll say, I want to sound sophisticated, so I'm going to look for the longest word in the thesaurus. But in reality, what happens is they end up picking a word that does not mean exactly what they're trying to say, and then they look silly, essentially. Um, and with this plain language consideration that we talked about earlier, it's actually better to frame, uh, to phrase words as simply as you can. So don't look for big words just to impress people. It's more important to be accurate and easily understood. 
And uh, for those of you who are uh, struggling with pronunciation, I just want to throw out there that if you say something with confidence, people usually don't call you out on it. <laughs> uh, and that's because there are uh, 1,100 ways to spell 44 distinct sounds in the English language. So when we are verbally communicating and reading, we can run into problems because O-U-G-H, for example, can sound like though, cough, rough, throughout, and plow. <laughs> um, so O-U-G-H in each of those has a different sound, so that's where we run into problems. So my advice to everyone is to just say it with confidence. Um, if someone corrects you, remember that. Um, I've also been known to use Google, and many of the dictionaries now have sound recordings <laughs> to look up words, particularly words that have um, a different language as their uh, base. So, for example, the word denouement, I did not know how to pronounce that. Uh, looked it up, typed it into, uh, you know, dictionary.com to listen to... Uh, someone say it first <laughs> before having to communicate it. And honestly, I would have looked for a different word, but for the field of people I was communicating with, that was one of their regular terms, and so that's why it was included. Otherwise, I probably would have used falling action instead. <laughs> All right, thanks for listening.